funding for this series has been provided in part by the following. Ringsacker Municipality in Norway. Journeys to extraordinary lands. Borten overseas since 1894. Rainy weather won't stop the outdoor activities. Cover all sports, all weather wear. This is a story about dedication. It's about the willingness to go the extra mile, to find and unlock nature's secrets. It's about tasteful selection and the understanding that every step of the journey is vital for the end result. This is the story of Evergood, a story that always ends well. I'll leave the fish like this smoking for about half an hour. And I must warn you, if you do this with your tent, the tent will always smell like smoke. Hi, and welcome to New Scandinavian Cooking from Ringerike in eastern Norway. I'm Andreas Wiestad. This is the land of fairy tales. It's an area rich in folklore where many of our national fairy tales were collected. And in today's program, we'll visit forests that look like they're home to trolls and big farms that are fit for kings. And I'll start off here by the edge of the forest where I'll make barley pancakes served with blueberry preserves. Then we'll head deep into the forest and go fishing for local trout. And I'll smoke the fish in a camping tent. Ringeriki is home to many big farms, both modern and traditional. I'm going to visit a modern salad producer and I'm going to make a salad with a dressing that tastes like, well, salad. And finally, in the middle of the traditional agricultural landscape of Ringerike, on the historic Moo farm, I'm going to make a roast rack of lamb with peas and red cabbage. If you were living here 100, 200 years ago, you had to live off nature. And if you didn't have a big farm, you had to live off the forest. You had to go hunting, fishing, foraging. And the forest represented a great big resource, but also a clear and present danger. Sometimes people would go into the forest and they just wouldn't come out. That combined with the sights, the sounds and the smells of the forest, which can sometimes be quite spooky and reek of the supernatural has been an inspiration for generations of storytellers and fairy tales. And that, I think, is why this region is particularly rich in fairy tales. This is one of my favorite places in Ringerike, where you can feel the presence of the forest and you have an overview of the lowlands beneath. Going hiking is really important in Norwegian culture. It's a part of our national DNA. And then there's an ever-returning question, what to eat when you get there? And most people have packed lunches, but sometimes you actually do a little bit of cooking as well. But it has to be very simple. I'm going to make some pancakes with wheat and barley. Here I've got two and a half deciliters, one cup of wheat, 
two and a half deciliters, one cup of fine barley flour, full teaspoon of baking powder, and a good pinch of salt. And then I just mix those dry ingredients together, and then I add some cultured milk, two cups or five deciliters. So it's a fairly thick or thickish batter. Ideally, I should leave it for a few minutes and then add two eggs and stir them into the mixture. And of course, if you're not making a television program, you can make the batter before you go hiking and just bring the batter with you. Oh, it's really hot and but it's very nice as well when it's this cold. And then I serve with preserved wild blueberries from this forest. This is a really good pancake. I love pancakes, but sometimes they can be just fluffy, but also insignificant is as if you're eating air. But because of the barley, there's a little more texture to it while it's still quite, quite light. Mm. You can find all the recipes at our website, newsgangcook.com. If you go back to the era of the fairy tales, the food was pretty robust. It was porridge, 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 bread, and if you were lucky, perhaps a piece of meat as well. If you come to Ringerike these days, you'll find that most of agriculture is pretty innovative. I'm here at Elstern Farm, where they grow more than 40 different types of salad, most of them on free land. But, Jermen, growing salad in Norway, in the high north, sounds like a bad idea. It's not a bad idea. It's a good idea, if you ask me, because we have uh, good soil, we have uh, fresh water and uh, perfect uh, light for uh, growing salad. But, it, but it's quite cold. It's uh, good uh, with the temperature down to 4 degrees, 8 degrees in the night. That uh, helps the salad to be strong, crispy and tasty. So that's, uh, that's uh, perfect. That's one of the recurrent themes here on New Scandinavian cooking. In the old days, chefs and producers really wished that they were in France or Italy. But more and more, they're realizing that the fact that we are far north, that it is quite cold, makes the quality of the produce quite unique in the and more and better or different flavor so can i taste one of your uh, your salads yes you can taste them good what do you want <laughs> i'm going to use this wonderful lettuce to make a salad and i think it's an interesting thing if you look at salad we eat it a lot but we don't care that much about the flavor of the lettuce itself we it tends to be all about the dressing or all about what comes with it. It's really better to use your hands than to use a knife. So to tear it into smaller pieces. And then I'm also using this beautiful red lolo salad. One is very often left with these bits and pieces of lettuce that you tend to throw away. But this is very often where a lot of the flavor is, the kind of chewy parts and stuff. Well, I'm going to use that as the base for my dressing. Now this juice is intensely flavored by the lettuce. It almost tastes more lettuce than the lettuce itself. And I'm just gonna add a little bit of dill as well. Look at this. I'm going to use this salad juice instead of vinegar, instead of lemon juice. I'm just going to add a little bit of mustard to give the dressing a bit of a kick and also to help to emulsify it. Then I add oil. This is rapeseed or canola oil. And just a sprinkle of salt. Salad, after all, is from the Latin word for salt. Some beautiful edible flowers. So this is corn flour, red clover, and pea flowers. And then finally some local charcuterie. There's a rich tradition for charcuterie from this region. And here you have it, 
a salad with what you can really term salad dressing and local charcuterie. It is interesting how much lettuce can actually taste. We think of it as the green stuff on the side, but it has its own flavor profile. It is fresh tasting. It has these green flavors, but also a hint of bitterness. It's really, really nice. You can find all the recipes at our website, newscancook.com. Ringerike is not far away from Oslo, but in all times it took almost a day to get here. And still, you can hike from the capital through the forest without seeing a single house along the way. It's a perfect setting for fairy tales. My friend and colleague Erik Röd has moved to Ringerike where he is farming but he also has a keen interest in mythology and folklore and Erik why do you think that so many of the fairy tales were collected just in this region? Well I think that uh, this area had natural conditions for just fairy tales with the dark woods and the small lakes and the mist and everything. Yeah, and, and whenever you walk through them, you uh, at dusk you think that the, that little tree over there is a troll or yeah, something coming right. towards you. Yeah. And people had tremendous respect for being out in the nature at night time. Mm. So they all hurried home. A lot of superstition. Do you think there was an element of sort of natural religion? Yeah, I think so. And I also think they kept these species from the natural religion as a protest against the big gap in society between the rich and the poor. Yeah. Uh, and I think that sitting around a fireplace like this, and especially cooking over an open fire, is such a unique thing. And that's a very Norwegian thing as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. And, you know, uh, fishing has always been uh, free for everybody to do, e even if you were poor or you're rich. Yeah, so. you didn't have to own the land in order to fish in the lake. Oh, that's right. Mm. I'm going to smoke this trout uh, over an open fire. Then I rub the fish with salt on the outside and on the inside in the cavity here. Then I hang it over the open fire. And in order to get a real smoky flavor, I've taken some dried wood shavings. This is juniper and also a couple of fresh juniper branches. And to make sure that they don't just catch fire, I'm wrapping them in foil and just making some hole in the foil. But now, of course, most of the smoke will just blow away and very little of it will hit the fish. So we have to do something about that as well. And I'll leave the fish like this smoking for about half an hour. And I must warn you, if you do this with your tent, the tent will always smell like smoke. It's quite common to serve salty and smoked fish or meat with sour cream. And I'm going to do precisely that, but I'm also adding two boiled potatoes that I'm just pressing through a sieve or a potato press like this, and then mixing into the sour cream. It makes it a little bit milder, a little bit sweeter. The fish is beautiful and the skin has kind of yellowed because of the smoke and it feels like it has mainly been cold smoked, which is good. Relatively low temperatures makes for the best smoking. So here you can see it's almost cooked near the tail where it was closest to the fire, but otherwise it's almost raw, just slightly salt cured and smoked. It really comes off the skin almost by itself. And a good spoon of the sour cream and potato mixture and I'll serve with powdered kale. This is just kale that I've dried in the oven at a very low temperature and I'm just pressing it through a metal sieve. Finally, some pickled mushrooms. And here it is. Isn't this one of the prettiest dishes you've seen with tent smoked fish? Well, it is for me at least. 
Eric, do you want a taste? Yes. It's a very nice smoky, smoky flavor. Uh, you, you can really feel the juniper, and I was a bit afraid that maybe maybe the tent would catch fire and you'd get that sort of plastic uh, taste, but it it does taste like uh, really like the forest. Yeah, it was really good. Mm. And, and the mushrooms, you made the mushrooms, they were delicious. Yeah. Perhaps we should try and get in before darkness comes. Mm. Mm. I never stay out when it's dark. Mm. I'm sure the trolls won't get anywhere near our tent. <laughs> Most of the fairy tales were written down in the 19th century when Norway was a young nation. We had basically been a Danish colony for centuries. All recognized culture was Danish. That was where the university was. The Norwegian elites went to Denmark to get educated. That was where the books were printed. And now, as an independent or more or less independent nation, we were trying to figure out who are we? And we started looking inwards and what Osbjørnsen and Moore did was they asked people, what kind of stories do you tell each other? And what they found was a rich treasure of folk stories. Some of the fairy tales have similarities to other European stories like those collected by the Grimm brothers or H.C. Andersen in Denmark. Others were uniquely Norwegian. They used the Norwegian nature, climate and social fabric. Many of the fairy tales are classic rags to riches stories and one of the recurring heroes is Askeladden or the Ash Lad. And like his brothers and basically everyone he knows, he's poor. He's from one of the small holdings in the forest. But the Ash Lad is different. All the others try to win the prize or win the princess by adhering to all the rules, by behaving gallantly and aristocratic and hiding their modest upbringing. But none of that for the Ash Lad. He is lazy, cool and cunning and he wins every time. The most important Norwegian collection of fairy tales is called Osbjørnsen and Moe, collected by the two friends Osbjørnsen and Moe. And you are the great, great, great niece of Jørgen Moe, one of these principal collectors of fairy tales. Yes, that's correct. Uh, and he grew up here on this farm. Yes, he was uh, growing up here. I think that in the fairy tales, there are so many kings and princesses and kingdoms but there weren't really that many kingdoms at the time and isn't it possible that a great big farm like this was considered a, being a bit of a kingdom at that time yes, i think so if there was a king with us with just a daughter everyone on the small holdings would think you know if i capture that that is like winning a kingdom yes i think that was uh thinking that mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. these fairy tales are a part of our sort of national treasure um, how important was it do you think that Jürgen Mo grew up just here and not somewhere else I think it was very important for him that he was growing up here and uh, he was uh, told these fairy tales from he was a very little boy and uh, so yes. th those those stories that we know today they they were told around the fireplace at yes, night. Yes, I was. They didn't have so many things to do. <laughs> so uh, yes, I was uh, sitting there and that was the stories. entertainment. That was the television of the time. Yes, it was. <laughs> yes. The farming operation here on the farm is uh, quite limited, but Jermen uh, grows some lovely cabbage just over there, and they still have some sheep and lamb. And uh, I'm going to make rack of lamb which is a beautiful cut it's quite tender near the uh, middle and it's got a little fatty flap on the outside which makes it a little bit more hardy you can expose it to quite high heat without the interior drying up so i'm just gonna add a bit of salt what i think is best when it comes to rack of lamb is to sear it in the pan first and then finishing it off in an oven that's not too hot but first I'm going to add a little bit of flavor of thyme and mushrooms. But in order to make them 
adhere and in order to add a little bit of sweetness I'm just brushing the meat with some honey as well. The thyme is really at its best when it's at the end of the season and it's just so incredibly aromatic. This is dried chanterelle mushroom. You can also use dried porcini. And then I bake the meat in the oven at 150 centigrade, 300 Fahrenheit for about 25 minutes. The temperature should not rise above 65 degrees Celsius or 150 Fahrenheit. I'm going to serve the lamb with local peas. And these peas have a peculiar history. Peas have been grown in Norway for at least a thousand years. But the last century or so, when it started to grow bigger peas, more uniform peas that give really high yields, and something has been lost while well, we've lost these old heirloom and heritage uh, varietals. But then a couple of decades ago on a farm, not far from here, they found a bag of dried peas and they just started growing them. And they found that it was this old varietal that had been grown here for centuries. And now it's a local specialty, much loved. And as you see, they're quite small and they all look a little different. So it's a cultured plant that has kept more of nature. I've soaked them in water overnight and you see they come out as beautiful green, some little whitish, some a little darker and browner. So I just pour off the water and I boil it with a couple of bay leaves. And then I just let it simmer for 15 to 20 minutes until the peas are soft. And now the peas are done. I think that they're at their best when they're, they're soft enough so they don't have a hard core in the middle, but still that they're a little bit chewy. They don't totally disintegrate. Because what I'm going to do is I'm gonna halfway mash them, keep some of them whole and some of them mashed. When these peas are quite mushy, I'm adding the whole piece. And then just adding a bit of butter and stirring it in to the mixture. Mm. This has got this deep, lovely pea flavor, quite old fashioned. I love it, but I also want a hint of freshness. Therefore, I'm juicing some whole green sugar snap peas. Mm. And it tastes even more of peas. It tastes like a millennium of agricultural history of what has been grown here. It also has that freshness of a pea that was just picked this morning. And I'm gonna serve with a simple red cabbage coleslaw. Try and cut the cabbage into as thin slices as possible. So you need a really sharp knife. One of the things that I find boring with a lot of uh, coleslaws is that they're just a little bit of uh, cabbage and a lot of mayonnaise is as if they're trying to hide the cabbage. I think it's much better to make a temperamental coleslaw. So I'm adding mustard, some oil, a sprinkle of salt, and I mix in an herb like garden cress for that extra bite. With a real coleslaw, you must always mix at least 27 times. Now, the meat is done. Remember that you can find all the recipes at our website, newscancook.com. And some baked beets. And here it is. Peas and cabbage, beets and lamb. This is food that must have been eaten here for a thousand years. online and on social media.